United States congressional apportionment is the process by which seats in the United States House of Representatives are distributed among the 50 states according to the most recent decennial census mandated by the United States Constitution. Each state is apportioned a number of seats which approximately corresponds to its share of the aggregate population of the 50 states. However, every state is constitutionally guaranteed at least one seat. The number of voting seats in the House of Representatives has since 1913 been 435, capped at that number by the Reapportionment Act of 1929 except for a temporary 1959 increase to 437 when Alaska and Hawaii were admitted into the Union. The size of a state's total congressional delegation also determines the size of its representation in the U.S. Electoral College, which also affects the U.S. presidential election process. Constitutional context Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution initially provided Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. Following the end of the Civil War, the first of those provisions was superseded by Section 2 of the Fourteenth Amendment. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state, being 21 years of age, and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion, or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such state. Reapportionment Reapportionments normally occur following each decennial census, though the law that governs the total number of representatives and the method of apportionment to be carried into force at that time are enacted prior to the census. The decennial apportionment also determines the size of each state's representation in the U.S. Electoral College. Under Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution, the number of electors of any state equals the size of its total congressional delegation House and Senate seats. Federal law requires the clerk of the House of Representatives to notify each state government no later than January 25 of the year immediately following the census of the number of seats to which it is entitled. If the number of seats has changed, the state determines the boundaries of congressional districts—geographical areas within the state of approximately equal population—in a process called redistricting. Any citizen of the state can challenge the constitutionality of the redistricting in their U.S. district court, because the deadline for the House clerk to report the results does not occur until the following January, and the states need sufficient time to perform the redistricting. The decennial census does not affect the elections that are held during that same year. For example, the Electoral College apportionment during 2000 presidential election was still based on the 1990 census results. Likewise, the congressional districts and the electoral college during the 2020 general elections will still be based on the 2010 census. <laughs> Number of members The size of the U.S. House of Representatives refers to total number of congressional districts or seats into which the land area of the United States proper has been divided. The number of voting representatives is currently set at 435. There are an additional five delegates to the House of Representatives. They represent the District of Columbia and the territories of American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, which first elected a representative in 2008, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Puerto Rico also elects a resident commissioner every four years. Controversy and history 
Since 1789, when the federal government began operating under the Constitution, the number of citizens per congressional district has risen from an average of 33,000 in 1790 to almost 700,000 as of 2008. Prior to the 20th century, the number of representatives increased every decade as more states joined the Union, and the population increased. The ideal number of members has been a contentious issue since the country's founding. George Washington agreed that the original representation proposed during the Constitutional Convention one representative for every 40, was inadequate and supported an alteration to reduce that number to 30,000. This was the only time that Washington pronounced an opinion on any of the actual issues debated during the entire convention. In Federalist No. 55, James Madison argued that the size of the House of Representatives has to balance the ability of the body to legislate with the need for legislators to have a relationship close enough to the people to understand their local circumstances, that such representatives' social class be low enough to sympathize with the feelings of the mass of the people, and that their power be diluted enough to limit their abuse of the public trust and interest. First, that so small a number of representatives will be an unsafe depositary of the public interests. Secondly, that they will not possess a proper knowledge of the local circumstances of their numerous constituents. Thirdly, that they will be taken from that class of citizens which will sympathize least with the feelings of the mass of the people, and be most likely to aim at a permanent elevation of the few on the depression of the many. Madison also addressed anti-federalist claims that the representation would be inadequate, arguing that the major inadequacies are of minimal inconvenience since these will be cured rather quickly by virtue of decennial reapportionment. He noted, however, I take for granted here what I shall, in answering the fourth objection, hereinafter show, that the number of representatives will be augmented from time to time in the manner provided by the Constitution. On a contrary supposition, I should admit the objection to have very great weight indeed. Madison argued against the assumption that more is better. Sixty or seventy men may be more properly trusted with a given degree of power than six or seven. But it does not follow that six or seven hundred would be proportionally a better depositary. And if we carry on the supposition to six or seven thousand, the whole reasoning ought to be reversed. In all very numerous assemblies, of whatever character composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Membership cap The Apportionment Act of 1911 public law 62 raised the membership of the U.S. House to 433 and provided for an apportionment. It also provided for additional seats upon the admissions of Arizona and New Mexico as states, increasing the number to 435 in 1912. In 1921, Congress failed to reapportion the House membership as required by the United States Constitution. This failure to reapportion may have been politically motivated, as the newly elected Republican majority may have feared the effect such a reapportionment would have on their future electoral prospects. A reapportionment in 1921 in the traditional fashion would have increased the size of the House to 483 seats, but many members would have lost their seats due to the population shifts, and the House chamber did not have adequate seats for 483 members. By 1929, no reapportionment had been made since 1911, and there was vast representational inequity, measured by the average district size. By 1929 some states had districts twice as large as others due to population growth and demographic shift. In 1929 Congress with Republican control of both houses of Congress and the presidency passed the Reapportionment Act of 1929 which capped the size of the house at 435 the then current number and established a permanent method for apportioning a constant 435 seats. This cap has remained unchanged since then, except for a temporary increase to 437 members upon the 1959 admission of Alaska and Hawaii into the Union. Three states, Wyoming, Vermont, and North Dakota, have populations smaller than the average for a single district. As of May 2016, there is approximately one representative for every 720,000 people in the country. Topic. Clemens v. Department of Commerce A 2009 lawsuit, Clemens v. Department of Commerce, sought a court order for Congress to increase the size of the House's voting membership and then reapportion the seats in accordance with the population figures of the 2010 census. 
The intent of the plaintiff was to rectify the disparity of congressional district population sizes among the states that result from the present method of apportionment. Upon reaching the U.S. Supreme Court in December 2010, the holdings of the lower district and appellate courts were vacated and the case remanded to the U.S. District Court from which the case originated with instructions that the District Court dismiss the case for lack of jurisdiction. Topic. Proposed expansion The first proposed amendment to the Constitution within the Bill of Rights attempted to set a pattern for growth of the House along with the population, but has not been ratified. Article the First After the first enumeration required by the first article of the Constitution, there shall be one representative for every 30,000, until the number shall amount to 100, after which the proportion shall be so regulated by Congress, that there shall be not less than 100 representatives, nor less than one representative for every 40,000 persons, until the number of representatives shall amount to 200, after which the proportion shall be so regulated by Congress, that there shall not be less than 200 representatives, nor more than one representative for every 50,000 persons. The proposed Wyoming rule calls for expanding the House until the standard representative to population ratio equals that of the smallest entitled unit currently the state of Wyoming. This proposal is primarily designed to address the fact that some House districts are currently nearly twice the size of others, for instance, there are just over 1 million residents in Montana's single district, compared to about 570,000 in Wyoming's. Although a larger house size will generally result in the smallest and largest districts being proportionally closer in size, this is not always the case. Therefore, in some cases, the Wyoming rule may actually result in an increase in the ratio of the sizes of the largest and smallest districts. For instance, after the 1990 census and with a house size of 435, the largest district Montana's at-large district had 799,065 residents, 76% larger than the smallest district Wyoming's at-large district with 453,588 residents. The Wyoming rule would have given a house size of 547 in 1990. Using that size, the largest district, North Dakota's at large district would have had 638,800 residents, 92% larger than the smallest districts Delaware's two districts at approximately 333,084 residents each, which is larger than the 76% figure mentioned above. On May 21, 2001, Rep. Alcee Hastings sent a Dear Colleague letter pointing out that U.S. expansion of its legislature had not kept pace with other countries. In 2007, during the 110th Congress, Representative Tom Davis introduced a bill in the House of Representatives that would add two seats to the House, one for Utah and one for the District of Columbia. It was passed by the House, but was tripped up by procedural hurdles in the Senate and withdrawn from consideration. An identical bill was reintroduced during the 111th Congress. In February 2009 the Senate adopted the measure 61-37. In April 2010, however, House leaders decided to shelve the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Apportionment methods Apart from the requirement that each state is to be entitled to at least one representative in the House of Representatives, the number of representatives in each state is in principle to be proportional to its population. No fair apportionment method was devised until recently with five distinct apportionment methods having been used since the adoption of the Constitution, with none of them producing fully proportional apportionment among the states. The first apportionment was contained in Art. I, Section 2, C.L. 3 of the Constitution. After the first census in 1790, Congress passed the Apportionment Act of 1792 and adopted the Jefferson Method to apportion U.S. representatives to the states based on population. The Jefferson Method required fractional remainders to be discarded when calculating each state's total number of U.S. representatives and was used until the 1830 census. The Webster Method, proposed in 1832 by Daniel Webster and adopted for the 1840 census, allocated an additional representative to states with a fractional remainder greater than 0.5. The Hamilton-Vinton largest remainder method was used from 1850 until 1900. The Vinton or Hamilton method was shown to be susceptible to an apportionment paradox. 
The Apportionment Act of 1911, in addition to setting the number of U.S. representatives at 435, returned to the Webster method, which was used until the 1940 census, when the current method, known as the Huntington Hill method or method of equal proportions, was adopted. The revised method was necessary in the context of the cap on the number of representatives set in 1929. The method of equal proportions The apportionment methodology currently used is the method of equal proportions, so called because it guarantees that no additional transfer of a seat from one state to another will reduce the ratio between the numbers of persons per representative in any two states. The method of equal proportions minimizes the percentage differences in the populations of the congressional districts. In this method, as a first step, each of the 50 states is given its one guaranteed seat in the House of Representatives, leaving 385 seats to assign. The remaining seats are allocated one at a time, to the state with the highest priority number. Thus, the 51st seat would go to the most populous state, currently California. The priority number is determined by a formula that is mathematically computed to be the ratio of the state population to the geometric mean of the number of seats it currently holds in the assignment process, and initially one, and the number of seats it would hold if the seat were assigned to it, and plus one. The formula for determining the priority of a state to be apportioned the next available seat defined by the method of equal proportions as a n equals p n n plus 1 display style a underscore n equals frac p sqrt n n plus 1 where p is the population of the state and n is the number of seats it currently holds before the possible allocation of the next seat an equivalent recursive definition is a n plus 1 equals n n plus 2 a n display style a underscore n plus 1 equals sqrt frac n n plus 2 a underscore n where n is still the number of seats the state has before allocation of the next and for n equals 1 the initial a1 is explicitly defined as a 1 equals p 2 display style a underscore 1 equals frac p sqrt 2 consider the reapportionment following the 2010 us census beginning with all states initially being allocated one seat the largest value of a1 corresponds to the largest state california which is allocated seat 51 after being allocated its second seat its priority value decreases to its a2 value which is reordered to a position back in line the 52nd seat goes to Texas, the second largest state, because its A1 priority value is larger than the N of any other state. However, the 53rd seat goes back to California because its A2 priority value is larger than the N of any other state. The 54th seat goes to New York because its A1 priority value is larger than the N of any other state at this point. This process continues until all remaining seats are assigned. Each time a state is assigned a seat, n is incremented by 1, causing its priority value to be reduced and reordered among the states, whereupon another state normally rises to the top of the list. The Census 2010 ranking of priority values shows the order in which seats 51 to 435 were apportioned after the 2010 census, with additional listings for the next five priorities. Minnesota was allocated the final 435th seat. North Carolina missed its 14th seat by 15,754 residents as the 436th seat to be allocated, 10 years earlier it had gained its 13th seat as the 435th seat to be allocated based on the 2000 census. <laughs> <laughs> Past apportionments Note, the first apportionment was established by the Constitution based on population estimates made by the Philadelphia Convention, and was not based on any census or enumeration. <laughs> <laughs> Changes following the 2010 census 
On December 21, 2010 the U.S. Census Bureau released its official apportionment results for congressional representation. The changes were in effect for the U.S. elections in 2012. Past increases The size of the U.S. House has increased and decreased as follows. Topic: 1789 to 1800. Topic: 1801 to 1850. Topic: 1851 to 1900. Topic: 1901 to 1950. Topic: 1951 to 2000. Topic: 2001 present. Topic: See also Apportionment paradox Congressional apportionment amendment Gerrymandering List of U.S. states by population List of U.S. states by historical population Tables of state populations since 1790 Redistricting Electoral vote changes between United States presidential elections United States Congress Topic Notes Delegate counts in italics represent temporary counts assigned by Congress until the next decennial census or by the U.S. Constitution in 1789 until the first U.S. Census. Elections held in the year of a census use the apportionment determined by the previous census.